So students, today we take up the paper on partition literature and the text I'm going to start with you today is uh, Manik Bandhubadhyay's The Final Solution. Now, uh, this is your DSE A3 paper and I had already shared the translated text with you quite a few days earlier. So I would assume that some of you have read the text and like I always say, those of you who haven't read the text, go ahead and read it. This is not a novel, it's a short story of some 10 to 11, 12 pages maybe. Um, and one important note here, one important point, those of you who can read Bengali, please go ahead and read the Bengali, uh, do read the Bengali version, which is the original version. Now, the reason I say this is while reading the translated version, I found that not only is the translation not very authentic, but in many cases, the idiom is poor and um, really a lot has lost in translation. So if you can afford to read Bengali, go ahead and read the Bengali version. And uh, even if you can or cannot read Bengali, you definitely have to read the English version anyway, um, at least for uh, the purposes of your syllabus. So that was one pointer I wanted to begin with. That said, I will first begin with an introduction of the author, right? So first let's talk about Manik Bandhubadhyay and then uh, we will take up the text. If not in this lecture, then definitely uh, we will have to take the text up in the subsequent lectures. But let's primarily focus on an introduction to Manik Bandhubadhyay and his contribution to, to uh, not just Bengali literature, but to Indian literature uh, more broadly. So one more thing that uh, would serve as an important reminder is the fact that this paper is on partition literature. And uh, when we talk about uh, partition, of course, we are referring to India being uh, split into uh, two countries, India and Pakistan. And uh, you obviously know, and you will definitely see the reflections um, in, in uh, this paper, DSEA3, that much of partition literature is either concentrated around uh, what is today Punjab and of course what is today West Bengal. So um, while in this paper I think you have texts by um, uh, Sadat Hosen, Manto, you have um, you also have uh, Sahir Ludhyanvi, right? So these are from the Punjab side of the story, Punjab, uh, Punjab version or Punjab edition of the partition, right? And on the other hand you have stories coming from Bengal, right? And one thing that is common to all these stories um, is that these are all stories of trauma, of extreme trauma. And uh, partition is something that has affected uh, millions of people and it, even today it continues to affect um, the next generations um, of, of the people who, um, who were directly affected by the partition. I mean, I mean um, many of us living today were not directly affected by partition, surely not because partition happened in 1947 um, and even most of our parents for that matter weren't born at that time. But it did affect uh, the generation before and there is something called collective memory and I will talk more about collective memory um, and and uh, collective memory or cultural memory, right? These are different and yet there are uh, there are degrees of similarity between these terms. And collective memory is something I have personally researched um, quite a bit and written a few research papers about. Um, so it's, it's, it's an area of interest for me. So which is why I, I take particular interest in uh, this text, right? Among obviously all the other texts are interesting and um, um, they have uh, merits of their own and they do look at different aspects of, uh, of collective memory. And, and different aspects of partition, right? And um, obviously, I'm not trying to say that Manik Bandhubadhyay is the final solution in this case has a greater degree or greater importance in terms of collective memory. What I'm trying to tell you is that collective memory is a thing, cultural memory is a thing, right? And I'm going to discuss that. Uh, and it is definitely something which has passed down uh, from generation to generation. So even after some 70 years after the partition, we are still reeling from its effects, right? Like uh, you and I, 
we definitely didn't directly uh, face partition we didn't have to run from this side of the border to the other or from that side of the border, border to this uh, but we are still facing uh, living under the direct political effects of it right the effects of partition are still there in in uh, the rhetoric of our politicians today if you have if you remember the lessons from your uh, paper on nationalism the the uh, lessons that you um, learned while i taught you tagore's nationalism you will surely be able to relate that even though partition has gone uh, has happened some 70 years ago uh, the the rhetoric of partition the rhetoric of violence and uh, discontentment between communities remains in some form or the other in forms of nationalism in forms of political rhetoric etc so which is why um, this is a very very important topic it's a very sensitive topic um, and and it does tend to upset um, different people right a lot of people are upset when uh, partition is spoken about and the nuances of partition are uh, brought in front of them particularly because it has a very living political dimension all right so think of that as a as an as a theoretical introduction and um, that theoretical introduction will be expounded upon later we are going to talk more about collective memory we are also going to talk about uh, cultural memory and and collective consciousness collective unconscious etc etc a lot of times uh, a lot of terms from psychology a lot of terms from cultural theory we are all going to bring them together while studying this text um, and make it as interesting as it can be however like i already warned you the translation itself is something i uh, as your teacher i'm not very comfortable with uh, uh, so i did recommend for those of you who can read bengali to go ahead and and read the bengali one um all right so now let's talk about manik bondobadhyay so manik bondobadhyay is um, as the name definitely gives away um, a bengali writer um, and he passed away sometime in in the 1950s 1956 i think uh, to be to be precise but do check on the dates if you are interested in knowing so uh, the important thing about manik bondobadhyay is that his life span his duration uh, his life's duration was amidst much of the turmoil that india as a as a country um, or as a subcontinent experienced right so he was born in the early decade first decade of the 20th century um, and he lived through uh, the harrowing experiences of partition and he passed away sometime in 1950s in the 50s right so he much of the violence much of the political rhetoric much of the rioting etc etc he saw first hand right and and he i'm going to talk about his features as an author um but before that let me just give you a glimpse of what is his contribution to indian literature right and perhaps more specifically to bengali literature but of course when you are reading a bengali author in in your english literature course obviously he is not limited uh, we do not restrict manik bondobadhyay or other authors um, we do not relegate them as just bengali literature right we have brought them out uh, from the narrow definition of uh, bengali literature and we have uh, placed them under a broader you know broader spectrum of indian literature or indian writing so keep that in mind and this will be particularly interesting if uh, during your higher studies your research area or your uh, area of specialization is indian literature so manik bondobadhyay's um, oeuvre or his entire uh, omnibus comprises of some 36 novels and and close to um, 250 short stories if i'm not wrong so some of his remarkable works uh, i will name quite a few and um, sometimes you may not be familiar with these names uh, but i'm sure if you talk to your parents or grandparents about uh, the works of manik bondobadhyay and they will probably be familiar with one or two of these right so i will tell you the original names and then i will also tell you the uh, in, n- names of the translated version so the most popular work right is podda nodir majhi and uh, the english translation is 
the boatman on on the river padma and then there is yet extremely famous work um, these are all best sellers by most important or most popular i mean best sellers right um, the second one is putul nacher iti katha the english translation is called um, the puppet steel a third very important text uh, third very important novel to be more specific is shahartuli right which deals with suburban or suburbs and uh, the translation is suburbia very simply put suburbia and one more important text that i want to uh, refer to is called chotushkon the quadrilateral in english and there are tons numerous movies made on these novels right lots and lots of bengali movies made by some of the best uh, film directors that india has ever had right so that is there uh, these texts are not lying there obscure these are very famous texts people who read bengali literature are very familiar with them uh, and even people who are not familiar with bengali literature directly are familiar uh, with his works at at different levels because they have been reproduced as films they have been translated into other languages not only in india but abroad because as you know bengali literature has a very you know very high seat in in and in, among indian literatures um, and within bengali literature manik bandopadhyay has a very prominent place as well so all of these things combined in addition to the fact that um, during the 60s 70s and 80s um, bengal had some of the best film directors um, that together with that manik bandopadhyay does really have a really significant and uh, you know prominent seat in in uh, in the list of indian authors not just in bengali but in all indian languages all right so um, manik bandopadhyay's works his his novels as well as his short stories were published in many prominent journals and literary magazines um of of his lifetime right and one of one or two of these names you will be familiar with for example anand bazar patrika anand bazar patrika is still in publication it's still i think uh, the most popular the highest selling newspaper in west bengal and probably one of the most highest selling newspapers in india uh, but um, the significance of anand bazar patrika here is that manik bandopadhyay published some of his stories some of his novels serially in anand bazar patrika or in the you know additional journals that come with anand bazar patrika right so this is one name i think most of you will be familiar with even if you don't read that paper like um, i used to read anand bazar at one time and i don't know i still read it sometimes um, but yes i don't like buy it anymore anyway that's a different point um, yeah, so uh, the point is anand bazar patrika is still very much there and it was still there when uh, it was there when manik bandopadhyay was writing and it published several important works of manik bandopadhyay so some of the other journals or literary magazines where his works were published are bichitra there is jugantar satyajug uh, there is bongosri uh, there is kalantar there is porichoy etc etc there are quite a few more but um, there's no specific need of going into that however i did mention some of these names because in case any of you are interested in manik bandopadhyay specifically and want to find out more about him and perhaps do some research on his work maybe not in the bachelor's level but later you will find this information very useful right so when you are doing your research um the information about journals and literary magazines is extremely extremely fundamental you may not realize this now but as you um as you go on to pursue higher education you will surely see how important it is all right um now some important facts about his life and also about his perception of life and his philosophy and uh politics right so um, his life was marked by poverty he was quite poor himself and he was very frequently ill right he was not a he was not a very healthy person right very frequently he fell ill um and and he worked as the editor of uh two very important journals in west bengal at that time uh, one is of course bongoshri which i have named before and there is yet another journal called 
nobaru now some of these are out of publication but quite a few of these are are still up and running and and actually quite uh, well in circulation of course anand bazar exam anand bazar is the best and most prominent example so uh, what what is special about manik bandobadhyay right and what sets him apart from um, mainstream or or other indian authors or other bengali authors so his salient feature perhaps the salient feature of his works is that he tried to analyze the multi dimensional facets of social reality right and he did this how he dwelt upon man's socio psychological orientation right so he was very interested in psychology and um, psychoanalysis and consciousness so like i began in the at the start of this lecture by talking about collective conscious collective memory and i'm definitely going to talk more about those those terms and those ideas and how they are significant here in addition to those terms also keep in mind what i just said that is manik bandobadhyay was extremely interested and aware of um, the socio psychological dimensions and orientations of human beings so naturally his fiction or or the short stories and novels that he has written um, his fiction examines and investigates different problems confronting uh, confronting the people of his time and also exploring their psyche or their minds so in a way what i am essentially telling you is uh, manik bandobadhyay manik bandobadhyay's works are works of psychoanalysis right he was extremely interested in psychoanalysis and uh, in his fiction that interest and that critique and analysis is extremely uh, well present right and this is where my problem with the translation stands because i find the translation um, as having lost much of that quality which was there in the original bengali form nonetheless i'm complaining a lot about the translation uh, nevertheless um, let's talk about a few more important facts about manik bandobadhyay that will help us study his works better so he was influenced like i said by freudian principles of psychoanalysis and also just like antonio gramsci whom you have studied in the previous semester manik bandobadhyay too was inspired by marxist philosophy he was very interested in marx and very interested in freud right so you will see where this is going and perhaps a few reflections of this few anticipations you will be able to also find in in uh, the short story that is the final solution so instead of describing uh, you know the idyllic pleasures of life uh, in rural societies manik bandobadhyay tried to describe the psychic um predilections perhaps is the word uh, and also the sinister workings of the human mind right so very interested in psychology and he was always looking for undertones of human speech right what 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 is the he was always trying to understand what was the other meaning of what has just been said what is written in between the lines what is a person saying when he, when he is not saying something or what is a person not saying when he is saying something right so these are very important questions for uh, freud and these are also very important questions for manik bandobadhyay now freud was as doctor he was a psychoanalyst and a, and a physician uh, or a doctor um, but manik bandobadhyay is an author and manik bandobadhyay does not have real life clients like freud right what he has is social reality he takes that reality he creates fiction from that reality and what he does in his fiction is what freud did and preached in real life all right so that should make sense let me know if it doesn't and we'll talk about this uh, in a later class as well so uh, the stories often um, his stories often unravel um, you know the dark and obscure enigmatic aspects of human lives uh, who often lead disturbed existences right under the garb of seemingly unruffled and peaceful reality so uh, if that was a bit too much to swallow let me 
break it down for you or let me provide you with some sort of uh, you know digest so what i'm trying to say is manik bandopadhyay as he was interested in the inner workings of the human mind he was always trying to point out or trying to show that under the garb of something peaceful something uh, unhappening or something undisturbed there may and often does lay something dark obscure and enigmatic right this is of course in in the context of the human psyche right so even when um, a human being is is apparently quiet and undisturbed and peaceful inside his or her mind there may be a major turbulence going on right and manik bandopadhyay's project right and when i say project don't think of term paper uh, manik bandopadhyay's project as an author has always been to find out what lay beneath this peaceful reality this apparent peaceful reality is just a facade a veil and manik bandopadhyay always wanted to explore what lay behind or beyond that veil or curtain so uh, he distinguished himself as a great novelist a uh, novelist in the tradition of uh, figures such as bonkim chandra robindranath sharad chandra these are like the top 3 perhaps right um, and and his fiction was about ordinary men and women he was manik bandopadhyay never writes about kings manik bandopadhyay does not write about uh, the fate of a country he does not write about uh, he does not write epics you know what i mean he is not writing about gods and kings and ministers he is writing about ordinary men ordinary men and women right he is writing about a woman um, who who has come across from others from the other side of the border and now is living on a railway station there is another story where he writes about uh, you know uh, a person a tat shilpi right tat shilpi is someone is a weaver right is a master weaver so um so these are the people he writes about and i have already told you what he is interested in so he writes about these characters and under their apparent reality beneath that layer of apparent reality he he explores uh what enigma what obscurity or what darkness lay under it uh so he was writing about ordinary men and women who endured extraordinary circumstances during the independence era and his writings gave a lot of people the chance to revisit some of the most heroic and yet forgotten characters of the times right and uh, in this story you will see mollika as a very interesting character um, and you will be able to see some of the things that i have just claimed uh, that are found in in manik bandopadhyay's characters so so um, as a novelist um, as as a also as a short story writer of course he was concerned with change um he was also concerned with the relation between cause and effect the relation between crisis and resolution and he was not merely content with recording or subjective analysis of historical events right so he was always remember i told you he was inspired by marxist philosophy so like so he has two projects first he does the analysis like freud but after doing that analysis he tries to draw change he tries to create change and if you remember from our lessons on um, gramsci you definitely remember that he was an emancipatory uh, thinker he was an emancipatory philosopher he was not a passive philosopher that is also the case with uh, manik bandopadhyay and hence the comparison with gramsci now of course like gramsci uh, manik bandopadhyay was not uh, a politician in the sense uh, that he led a movement which gramsci did uh he was not similar to gramsci in the sense that gramsci spent years of his lives in jail uh where mussolini threw him into that was not the case with uh manik bandopadhyay nonetheless gramsci was not a sh- fiction writer gramsci in jail wrote theoretical works he theoretical works in the sense that he tried to break down marxist philosophy marxist understanding of the world and explain it uh, in a way that is suitable to the modern world right in other words let me again reiterate in in plainer language perhaps so marx was writing in the 1840s 1850s 1860s gramsci um and by the time gramsci was writing his prison notebooks it was the 1940s so there was a gap of some 70 or 80 years 
Now, obviously, in 70 or 80 years, politics had changed. Na the boundaries of nations had changed. People had changed. Culture had changed, right? So what Gramsci was trying to do was he was trying to update what Marx had done. Similarly, while Manik Bondabadda does not work on the philosophy itself, he builds up on Marx's philosophy, applies it to the world he lives in, and tries to drive change. He tries to bring change. All right. So change is a very important aspect in Marxist philosophy, as you already know, because um, Marxist thinking, as far as the authors that you have already read, Gramsci, here, Manik Bandhubadhyay, and of course, Marx himself with Engels and some other, uh, there are tons of, you know, dozens of Marxist philosophers I could name, but that won't be very significant at this moment. The point I'm trying to make is just like Gramsci, uh, Manik Bandhubadhyay is not a passive uh, or traditional intellectual or traditional author, he is very much emancipatory. If you remember that quote from Marx with which I had begun Grams the class on Gramsci, uh, philosophers of the world have only interpreted the world until now. I'm not quoting, I'm paraphrasing. The challenge is to change it, right? So this is what uh, Manik Bandhubadha is attempting. But first of all, he is a Freudian psychoanalyst of sorts in fiction and then Using that psychoanalysis, he drives change, right? So um, this is our introduction. This is my introduction for you. And um, in the next class and from the next lectures, of course, we are going to uh, take up the text itself. Now, if you have any questions, as always, you can ask me. Uh, but I'm not sure how many of you actually listen to these lectures. Um, so yes, if you have questions, let me know.